outcome. Today we will discuss the approach to the patient with a gastrointestinal bleed. So we'll begin with a case. Mr. Gibb is a 56-year-old man with chronic knee pain who presents to the emergency department with two days of coffee ground emesis. He complains of dull epigastric pain and nausea. He takes 800 milligrams of ibuprofen three times a day for knee pain. He drinks three to six beers a day. His only medications are a baby aspirin, metoprolol, and ibuprofen. His vitals show a temperature of 37, blood pressure 89 over 55, heart rate 106, and saturation of oxygen 98% on room air. His physical exam reveals conjunctival pallor and tenderness to palpation in the epigastric region without rebound or guarding. A nodular liver edge is palpated five centimeters below the costal margin. His hemoglobin is 11 from a prior value of 14 and platelets are normal his INR is 1.2. So we are asked, what is the best next step in management? Before we answer that question, let's get to some key features in this case. So his symptoms of coffee ground emesis with dull epigastric pain are some concerning GI symptoms. In addition, we know that he has frequent NSAID use and alcohol use. If we look closely at his vital signs and his physical exam, we know that he has some signs that are concerning for hypovolemia, he has anemia, and some localizing symptoms on his exam that may help us with our differential. Now let's look at his hemoglobin. This is quite low. For a normal adult male, it would be from 14 to 18. So he is anemic, and we'll discuss what that means. So now let's talk a little bit more about gastrointestinal or GI bleeds. The difference anatomically between an upper GI bleed and a lower GI bleed is the cutoff point of the ligament of trites. This is in the fourth portion of the duodenum. So everything above that is an upper GI bleed and everything below is a lower GI bleed. The reason why we care about that is because upper GI bleeds present differently from lower GI bleeds. So with an upper GI bleed, patients tend to come in with melana, which is dark or black colored stools, or they may have hematemesis, which is the vomiting of bright red blood. On the other hand, lower GI bleeds tend to present with hematochesia. This is when there is bright red blood that is passed from the rectum. Keep in mind, however, that a very quick upper GI bleed may also sometimes present with hematochesia if the bleeding is occurring fast enough. So when I see a patient complaining of any one of these symptoms, I always want to make sure to ask about these important risk factors. So the patient's past medical history, have they ever had a GI bleed before? Do they have a known history of ulcers or a history of infection with H. pylori? These are some of the things I want to ask. You also wanna make sure to ask about their medications. So do they use NSAIDs frequently? Are they on any anticoagulants or antiplatelet agents like aspirin or clopidogrel? And importantly, do they take iron supplements? This is because iron pills can actually turn the stool a dark color and may obscure the clinical picture of a GI bleed. You also want to ask about their social history. So are they a smoker or do they use heavy alcohol? And in their history, you'll want to get at any comorbid conditions such as cirrhosis, any renal disease, or cancers. Other associated symptoms such as dysphagia or difficulty swallowing, any unintentional weight loss, were they vomiting frequently prior to the episode, and have they had any other changes in their bowel habits. So that brings us to the differential diagnosis for GI bleeds. It is quite a broad differential, so we'll break it down first into upper and then lower GI bleeds. Your historical risk factors can help you narrow down your differential diagnosis. So if your patient comes in complaining of bleeding with heavy NSAID use or alcohol use, your differential might include gastric or duodenal ulcers or erosive esophagitis, gastritis, or duodenitis. If they have a known history of liver disease or cirrhosis, then your differential should include esophageal or gastric varices and portal hypertensive gastropathy. The next thing on your differential is the arteriovenous malformation or AVM. 
This is a rare cause of GI bleeding, but should always be on the differential since it is always a present risk. Next, if your patient has describes a history of frequent vomiting prior to presenting with bleeding, then you could suspect a Mallory Weiss tear. And the last thing that should always be on your differential is cancer. Now let's move to lower GI bleeds. In patients who describe a history of chronic constipation, you should be more concerned about diverticulosis and hemorrhoids. Those who have a long-standing history of diarrhea along with bloody bowel movements might be concerned for inflammatory bowel disease. Those who describe abdominal pain along with their bleeding may have ischemic colitis. Just as with upper GI bleeds, you should always be concerned for an AVM. And in the right patient who just descri describes a history of infectious symptoms along with their bloody bowel movements, you might think of infectious colitis. And lastly, cancer as always should be on your differential for all GI bleeds. So now let's move to the physical exam. There are some important physical exam findings that can help you stratify whether your patient is sick or not sick. So the first thing to look at is their heart rate. If their patient has resting tachycardia, so a heart rate greater than 90 at rest, this implies that they have already lost about less than 15% of their total blood volume. Keep in mind here though, that if your patient is taking a medication that can slow down the heart rate, like a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker, then this finding may not be present and you might be falsely reassured. The next thing you can check is orthostatic hypotension. If your patient meets these parameters in the drop of their blood pressure from a supine to a standing position, this indicates they have already lost greater than 15% of their total blood volume. So this is already a concerning finding. Next, if your patient is already hypotensive while lying flat, in general, we consider this a blood pressure less than 90 over 60. However, keep in mind that your patient's baseline blood pressure may be a bit lower, so you always want to compare to their known baseline. If they're hypotensive just lying flat, this indicates to us that they have already lost greater than 40% of their total blood volume, and this is one of your sicker patients. The next thing you wanna do is a focused abdominal exam. This can be helpful to look for things like rebound tenderness, involuntary guarding, or extreme pain when you palpate the abdomen. These things can be helpful to look for signs of peritonitis. Peritonitis occurs when there is a perforated organ or the patient has developed bowel ischemia. And lastly, the most important thing you should always remember to do when seeing a patient with a GI bleed is a rectal exam. You want to look for either grossly bloody stool or black colored melanotic stool. In addition, you can also check for things like an anal fissure or hemorrhoids or any masses in the rectum that might help you focus your differential diagnosis a bit more. So now let's move to laboratory studies. There are several lab studies that you should always make sure to get in a patient presenting with a GI bleed. The first is a complete blood count or CBC. Here, you're looking specifically for a drop in the hemoglobin or low platelets. Keep in mind here though, that a drop in the hemoglobin may not be immediately apparent because the loss of whole blood, after the loss of whole blood, it takes time for the body to re-equilibrate and that drop in hemoglobin may be delayed by about a day or so. The next thing you wanna check is your basic metabolic panel or BMP. You can look specifically here for a BUN to creatinine ratio. When the BUN to creatinine ratio is greater than 30 to one, this has been shown to correlate well with the presence of an upper GI bleed. Keep in mind though, that this is only helpful for upper GI bleeds and not lower GI bleeds. The next thing you can look at is your liver panel. Here, you're looking specifically for signs of impaired liver synthetic dysfunction. So in this case, a low albumin may be helpful. Next, you always wanna check coagulation factors to look for any coagulopathy that might exist for your patient and make it more difficult to control bleeding. And the last thing you could check is, an, is a lactate. 
Here, if you find an elevated lactate, this may be a sign that your patient has developed signs of end organ dysfunction and needs to be more aggressively resuscitated. So let's take a brief moment to talk a little bit about further tests you might do for GI bleeds. There is a test called an FOBT, or fecal occult blood testing. As a high value care tip, this is not a test that you should use to look for active GI bleeding. It has a very poor sensitivity and specificity for active GI bleeds, and really should only be used in the screening for colorectal cancer. So now let's talk about the management of a GI bleed. The first most important step is to establish adequate IV access. By this, we mean placing at least two large bore peripheral IVs, which are 18 gauge or larger, or placing a centrally placed large bore catheter. The goal is to be able to rapidly infuse blood products and fluids. So to understand why this is important, we'll have to go back to your physics knowledge. So recall from Poiseuille's law in physics that flow or Q in this equation is affected exponentially by the radius and inversely by the length. So, why we care about a large bore IV is because we want a short length and a wide radius in our catheter to make sure that we can maximize the flow through the catheter. The next step in management is fluid resuscitation. You want to give crystalloid fluids such as normal saline or lactated ringer solution. Next, you should consider transfusing the patient with blood products. So we'll break it down by each type of blood product. First, you should consider packed red blood cells or PRBCs. In general, we use a transfusion threshold of a hemoglobin less than seven for most patients. However, you might consider a higher transfusion threshold of less than eight for patients who have coronary artery disease or have active bleeding. The next blood product you should consider is platelets. In general, we transfuse platelets for patients who are actively bleeding when their baseline platelets are less than 50,000. There are other blood products you can consider, such as fresh frozen plasma, or FFP, to correct underlying coagulopathies. However, that is beyond the scope of this lecture. The next step in management is to give medications to stabilize the bleeding. So all patients should receive a proton pump inhibitor. This is to reduce acid secretion in the stomach and hopefully slow the rate of bleeding if they have an upper GI bleed. Next, you can consider giving vasoactive medications such as octreotide, but this is only if you suspect a variceal bleed. The last thing you can consider is any reversal agents for anticoagulants that your patient takes if they are available. The last step in management after you have fluid resuscitated and stabilized the patient is to consult the GI specialist. This is so that they can perform both diagnostic and therapeutic interventions to control the bleeding. So now let's move on to talk about the various diagnostic and therapeutic studies we have available. So the gold standard for diagnosing and controlling a GI bleed is upper or lower endoscopy. There are other options we have available, including push enteroscopy. This is a more complicated type of endoscopy by which we are able to visualize the small bowel, which is otherwise unable to be reached by either upper or lower endoscopy. The next tests you may consider are nuclear scintigraphy, which is a tagged red blood cell scan, or CT angiography. By either of these modalities, you can detect slower rates of GI bleeding. However, keep in mind that both of these tests are imaging tests only, and so you may find the location of the bleeding, but you will not be able to intervene. The last test we have available is standard angiography. This is usually performed by interventional radiologists who can thread a catheter through the groin up into the vessels that may be contributing to the bleeding. This is also a therapeutic intervention if they are able to find and embolize the vessel that is causing the bleeding. So now that we've gone through all of that, let's return to our case. We had Mr. Gibb, who is a 56-year-old man who's coming in with some concerning GI symptoms 
He does have a history of NSAID and alcohol use, and he has signs on exam of hypovolemia, anemia, and some localizing symptoms of epigastric pain. He is also shown to be anemic. So, now we know that his symptoms of coffee ground emesis and dull epigastric pain are concerning for an upper GI bleed. In addition, his risk factors of heavy NSAID and alcohol use place him at risk for a differential of peptic ulcer disease, potentially gastritis, or cancer. So we are asked what is the best next step in management? Now we know that the first step is always to establish adequate peripheral IV access. And note that he already has supine hypotension, so he should be given aggressive fluid resuscitation. At this time, he currently does not meet the threshold for a packed red blood cell transfusion with a hemoglobin of 11. But he is presenting with general bleeding, so a proton pump inhibitor should be started. Thank you very much for your attention.